Hello everyone, um, welcome to our stream tonight. Um, I hope all of you can hear me. Uh, it's a bit of an experimental thing for us. It's the first time we've done something like this really, so uh, if you could all just let me know in the chat whether you can hear me or not, you should be able to see it in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. That would be really good. Um, while you're doing that, just a little bit of housekeeping for the stream. Uh, if we do lose the stream and it and it stops streaming, we'll try and get it back. But if we can't, then I'm afraid it's kind of end, end game there. Um, if it's poor quality, do just let us know in the chat. We'll do our best to, to improve it where we can. Uh, we'll also be using some polling software just for a little bit of a Q&A throughout the session. Uh, there's links in the description for these. And there's also QR codes on the poll slides for you to, to scan with your phones. It's up to you, whichever you want to choose. Um, at the moment, I haven't seen anyone type in chat, so I'm not sure if you can hear me or not. I think you should be able to. Um, we'll just give it a minute and see if anyone types anything. There we go, yeah, okay. Cool. So, um, tonight it's going to be myself and Immy. If Immy's there, just a quick hi. Yeah, yeah, I'm about. Um, okay. Just in case you guys uh, are wondering, I would recommend taking notes through all this. When you get your pack, have a book with it all in. Um, but I would recommend taking a few notes, especially for the quiz parts, so you don't get stumped for that. But, yeah, that's all I've got to say. Okay, cool. Yeah, like like Amy says, you guys won't have the Sports Diver training packs for now. Um, this is just kind of an introduction lecture, really, so you don't need them. But by all means, take some, some personal notes if you want to. Uh, this lecture will be recorded and will be available to re-watch whenever you want on the YouTube channel, so you can always rewind and have another look. It's up to you guys. Um, so if that's everything and everyone can hear us, we'll, uh, we'll make a start. So what we're going to cover today... Um, we'll just do a quick quick list. Um, the, the main kind of target of this lecture is really to cover why you'd want to become a sports diver and, and what changes that brings to your, your diving career. Um, so just to break that down a little bit further, your sports diver course, uh, what, what it actually includes, because obviously it's slightly different to the ocean diver course, um, what you're actually able to do as a sports diver. Obviously, that, that changes very differently to a to an ocean diver. It's the next level up, and it's really a, a good kind of progression from, from there. The next thing really is, is variety in diving. This is where the fun stuff really starts coming into the course. Different types of environment will encounter as a sports diver, and then different types of underwater conditions you'll find. Uh, these can include depth, currents, and groundswell as well. The other thing we want to consider maybe is planning around these conditions, so, so trying to predict what they'd, they'd be underwater and how we can do that, so what causes the variations in these conditions, and the water temperature and surface conditions and how that has an effect on our diving as well. And finally, the, the, the best bit of the course, I'm, I'm pretty sure everyone's looking forward to this, but the risk assessment side of this as well. Uh, sorry, Go for uh, it. I forgot to mention, uh, there is two other instructors in the chat as well, so if you guys have any questions throughout, you can just type it in the chat and they'll get back to you or me and Barney will answer it if we hear it first. Um, Absolutely. In case you have a question. Yep. Well done. Forgot to mention that. Um, also, at the end, we'll take some more questions if there's there's any left as well. So by all means, ask in, in the chat, and if those instructors can't answer it, I'll uh, I'll cover them at the end. Okay, moving on. Um, so the sports diver course, what does it actually contain? So we have six theory lessons. This is one of them. Um, obviously, with the COVID situation, the way we deliver these theory lessons is going to be slightly different for the previous years. So normally we do this in a classroom, a bit more interaction, but we're not really sure whether that's going to be possible at the moment. So this is a bit of a trial run for that. You'll also have a sheltered water lesson. We also call them pool lessons. So normally in Ocean Diver, you'd have five of these, whereas you've only got one in Sports Diver. So it's a little bit less content for that. You also have five open water lessons. So that's the, say, uh, one, more than, one more than Ocean Diver, yeah. Um, and then on top of that, you've actually got two dry practical lessons. So these are typically your rescue skills like CPR. And we'll just go through those normally in a classroom. Again, it depends on what kind of access we have. On top of that, you'll have five different experience dives. So you really do need to kind of expand your, your experience on different conditions. And really what we need from you guys is a bit of commitment to the to the course. It, it does take a little bit more effort than Ocean Diver maybe. There's more content. There's a, a certainly a, a bigger breadth of content. 
and a bit of self-study with the student notes and the manuals you'll get in your training packs really do go a long way especially for the theory tests so we'll have a quick look at what sports divers can actually do with regards to interaction between different qualification levels you can dive with an ocean diver in conditions already encountered by that ocean diver so you can't go taking them off to 40 meters and doing what you want you've got to be within that ocean divers experience level you can also dive with another sports diver. This is just as long as it's in, uh, in, in conditions already encountered during the training or previous experience that you've expanded with a higher grade of diver. So although you might not have done drift dive in training, you may be able to do that if you've expanded your experience with a higher qualified diver. You can also dive with dive leaders or above, so that includes instructors. And this really is so you can expand that experience. Um, Training can only take you so far, getting in the water and doing some dives with a slightly more qualified instructor maybe just to guide you where you're going. It's a really good way of expanding that experience. You'll also notice a trend here that all of them say under the supervision of a dive manager, so keep that in mind. And in terms of what you're actually qualified to physically do, your depth is still initially limited to 20 meters as you are an ocean diver, but the option of depth progression does open up to you. So you'll do progressively deeper dives, starting at 25 meters and then 30 and then 35 meters. And that really does allow you to expand your, your depth experience. And we'll get on to why that's good a little bit later in the presentation. The other thing you'll be allowed to do finally is some decompression diving. So in ocean diver you've always been told that you can't do deco, deco stops but sports diver you're allowed to do that because you've basically been trained how to plan those safely so a quick look at the variety that you'll come across in diving obviously ocean divers most of you will have only done the training dives in stony cove it isn't a huge amount of variety which is unfortunate but sports diver really bolsters your confidence and your skills as a diver and allows you to go and explore this variety that we really do have in, a, in the country. So some of the variety comes from different types of dive sites. Uh, reefs and walls are one of the more obvious ones. So you can see a picture of a lovely blue watered reef there. That's kind of a broad trips. Uh, we do those every year. Um, obviously there's dangers that come along with these. If, if you're on a nice big wall, there's nothing to stop you just dropping too deep if you're not paying attention. So the, there are considerations with those as well. You can also get into some drift diving. So you won't have experienced this unless you've gone and sought a drift dive. But if you manage to get yourself in a current, if as long as you plan for it and it's, uh, it's, it's safely controlled, it can actually be quite a good experience. We also have quite a lot of wrecks in the UK. Um, with your depth progression, on the sports diver you'll be able to see some more intact wrecks we'll come across that in a little bit um, and and the reason for that really is because wrecks above 20 meters they tend to have a lot of surface travel interaction currents water movements that break them up over the years whereas wrecks below that kind of threshold they tend to stay intact more often and so because of that a lot of the wrecks you'll find will actually be recognizable rather than just a pile of junk that you can't really understand so the other variety you'll find is underwater conditions. So some of these you might have experienced in Stony Cove, but we'll just quickly go over them. So depth variety, obviously at different depths, your conditions can change. Um, the, the currents really do have quite a big effect, especially on the subsequent underwater conditions like visibility. I'm sure if you've been in Stony Cove, you're well aware of the changes in visibility and how that can affect a dive. Uh, and also temperature, obviously in Stony Cove that, that changes its temperature throughout the year quite significantly. So some of you may have been in Stony Cove in February, which it was a kind of three, four degrees Celsius on the surface. I was just in there two days ago and it was 24 degrees on the surface. So it really does make a difference the time of year you go in there. The other variation you may find is surface conditions. So this is a consideration for divers, even though we're more interested in underwater because we need to get in and out of the water. Obviously, if your uh, surface condition is stormy and waves everywhere, a shore entrance might actually be pretty much impossible, depending on how violent that storm is. You can also consider surface cover and support. Um, it's always good to have surface cover where you can, just in case anything does happen, they can manage that emergency. So a little bit more detail about underwater conditions. 
um, with the same site, even in the, the course of the same dive, site conditions can vary. So you'll start the dive with lovely clear vis, and then if you get a current, bring up some silt, or someone kicks something up as well, divers can cause changes, your visibility can change very quickly. The other thing that might change is through depth, the temperature. So if anyone's been below nine meters or so in Stony Cove, you might have felt a sudden change in temperature. So although it's technically the same site, your temperature can, can change very rapidly. And anticipating that as part of our planning is what we're going to learn about in Sports Diver in the subsequent lectures. So it's, it's learning how to adapt to that and make sure that changes like that won't just require you to abort a dive. So lovely little animation there. So let's have a look at some depth. This is something that confuses a lot of people, so I'll try and take it relatively slow. Um, in Stony Cove, if we think about something we're very familiar with, the depth is very constant. It's it's not a tidal body of water. It doesn't change. If we lock, if we look at the ocean, however, you've got tides, and that changes the depth. Now tides are caused by the moon's gravity. So if we see in this lovely little picture. We've got the moon and the planet, and the moon's gravity is pulling the water to one side of the planet. You get a reciprocal bulge of water on the other side of the planet, and that's what we call high water. So it's, it's a raising of the level of water. We also have an effect from the sun's gravity, although this is more minimal, if we uh, get a diagram up here, it's more minimal, it does still have an effect. And this is what, what produces what we call neap and spring tides. So neap is the small tides and springs are the higher tides. So we can see a diagram there for neap tides where the, the moon is on the kind of opposite side to the sun, so they're not in line, and that means the two, graphic, the two uh, gravitational forces are acting against each other, which reduces the tidal range, which is something we'll cover in a second. We also have spring tides, uh, and this is when the moon and the sun are in line, so the gravitational forces combine together to make even greater tidal range. So this tidal cycle uh, repeats approximately every 12 hours. So we can plan around this, and bear in mind this is approximate because it does shift throughout the year. Um, but we also have a lunar month, so the, the cycle the moon goes through every 28 days. And this means that we have a spring and a neap tide twice every month. So you'll be able to find some calendars that will have, uh, I think the BZAC ones have it written on, if you can find a BZAC year planner. They've got neap and spring tides marked on, on the calendar, and you'll see them move throughout the year. It's not just a, a constant thing. Now if we think about how that affects our, our diving depth, tidal range is something I mentioned before. Um, and it's basically, we have a low water, if we have a nice little picture here. So this is at the low water, so the tide's gone out, as most people would say. So we have a certain depth at low water. We also have high water, so when the tides come in. And the difference between these two is called the tidal range. It's the difference between high water and low water. Now if we put some numbers on this, so let's say our low water is at 20 metres and our high water is at 25 metres, that means our tidal range is 5 metres, so it's the difference between the two, which is 5 metres. And there's your little formula for it. Now if we have a think about what that actually means for our diving, an ocean diver who's qualified to 20 metres could actually dive the site on low water. But if we tried to dive it on high water, they'd be 5 metres off the bottom, which, if the visibility is bad, would potentially mean mid-water diving, which isn't fun for anyone. So we really do have to keep this in mind, especially when we have maybe more restrictive uh, qualifications like ocean divers and some new sports divers. It really does make a difference for some sites. Another thing that is a, a tidal effect that you may not have experienced are currents and, gr and, and groundswell. So tidal currents, these, uh, these come from basically the water being restricted on, on where it can move. So the water is trying to level itself out relative to the surrounding water and that means it has some horizontal movement. So they end up having movement, so we, we, we call this fall, ebb, or rise and flood. So this is when tide is moving, so get some arrows up on here and you can see it's moving across and then it circles back on itself. So this is the, the tidal cycle, and we end up having a back and forth motion, essentially. 
What this produces, however, in, in the ends, you can see just labelled there, are slack waters. And what that essentially means is there's no movement or very minimal movement of water. Now, most of the time, if we're aiming for static sites like a wreck, you can see in the picture, we want to aim for that slack water. So there'll be a little bit of paper that we can predict the times of that slack water and we'll want to dive in that time. The main reason for this is so we don't have a current going across the static site that's trying to pull us off that site. So we're not fighting a current and, and that then reduces our exertion and, and so on. So that's, that's one way of looking at it. Uh, the other thing is if we want to do drift diving, then we actually want to aim for the current rather than slack water. So knowing when it's going to be a current and when it's going to be slack water works in both, work both ways really. Another effect that you might not have experienced is something called ground swell. So this is when we have a bit of wind that causes waves. Obviously waves are a movement of water and although we think waves as very much a surface condition, what it actually can do is have an effect underwater of moving you back and forth as a diver. So you may actually feel this on the seabed as kind of a back and forth motion and this can be quite nauseating and slightly sickening. So it's something to, to keep in mind if you may be vulnerable to something like that. Okay, so quiz one. So just a quick kind of recap on, on what we're doing. So if you could just either click the link in the description on the YouTube video or scan the QR code and you'll be able to answer some questions. There's two questions. Um, the first one is what is the tidal range and then the second one is name some underwater conditions. So just give you a couple of minutes to do that uh, and then we'll have a look at the answers and see what people have come up with. So it's looking promising so far. Just uh, got the answers up on here and it looks like most people are getting the gist of it, which is good. Okay, so we'll have a quick look at this. So what is the tidal range? Uh, the depth at high water? Not quite. Uh, depth at low water, same thing, just the other end. It's not really a range, is it? Um, the difference between high and low water. So, like I said, that is the correct answer. Well done. Everyone seems to have gotten that. The distance the water recedes is typically a common answer we get, and that's just because people think of range as a horizontal distance. So, try and keep in mind it's the distance between the high and low water, so a difference between those two. Okay, well done, guys. Next question. Name some underwater uh, conditions you may encounter. So what have we got? We've got some reduced visibility. Visibility, so it's a popular one from people who've been at Stony. Uh, temperature, absolutely, is a big one. With, uh, with maybe depth changing, we can get different temperatures. We can also get different temperatures across the seasons. Something I may not have mentioned at Stony, uh, we can have a, a larger range of temperature because it's a smaller body of water than the ocean. So something to consider as well. The other thing to consider with, with seasonal temperature is water tends to lag behind normally about three months. So what you'd consider summer in, in the air, probably kind of June, July time, for the highest temperatures, you're looking at more August, September, October in the water because it lags behind. So that's definitely a big consideration for us. Uh, another one, current. Yeah, absolutely. If we're doing some sea diving, a bit of current is always going to make a difference to us. It's something we really do need to plan around um, to the point where you'd be choosing your, your expedition dates around the different tides and that kind of stuff to try and get the best current you possibly could, whether you wanted the current or you didn't want it. For example, if you wanted to do some dives on a wreck and you didn't want currents, you'd be really trying to look at NEEP uh, weekends or, or times to go because even if you do accidentally get caught in that current, it might be just slightly slightly less. Ground swell is another good one, yep. So again, waves going back and forth, very nauseating. I don't know if anyone's ever been in something like that. Feel free to put a message in the chat if you have. Um, but I've I've experienced it. It's, it's 
I'd, I'd say it's it's nauseating but oddly fun in a weird way because uh, you get kind of pushed around a bit. So yeah, well done guys. That's that's a, a good answer. Um, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand over to Imi, uh, who will do the next section of the PowerPoint, and I'm sure she'll uh, she'll walk us through that nice and nice and well. So Imi, if you're uh, happy to take over. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to take you through the second half of this, all the way up to quiz two. Um, no one's asked any questions yet, which is great if you understand what's going on. But again, if you feel that you can't ask a question in the chat or you don't want to or it sounds stupid, you can always message one of us on Facebook. I'm sure it's easy enough to find us from the group chats um, if you do have any questions. Um, so yeah, we'll crack on. So the first bit I'm going to talk about is the underwater expectations. So this all links to what Bonnie's already talked about um, and what your visibility can then be affected by. So we've talked about the waves and we've talked about the current. Um, but the third one here is algal bloom. Now, I did this in like biology, but basically when it's really sunny, then obviously all the algae, all the green stuff grows um, and makes your visibility really bad. And I'm sure you've all witnessed it in Stony Cove and everything looks green and murky and that is just algae that has grown. Um, and the fourth one is the recent rainfall. So if it's rained at a quarry and all the water's come down the side, it can wash in bits of silt and stone and that can make the visibility bad. Equally, the rain can then, you know, it falls at the surface, but if that makes the water level rise, you can wash in more dirt from the sides and that can make your visibility worse. So you need to take that into account. If it's rained really heavily for the past week, the visibility might not be what you expect. Um, secondly, we've got the local seabed conditions. Um, you know, the silt is really easily kicked up if it's sandy. Um, so if you've got divers going at like nine o'clock in the morning, kick up all the sand and then you get in in the afternoon it's going to be really bad visibility if it's pebbles or rocks you know you're less likely to witness that because it's harder to you know kick those up but especially sunny conditions all the silt is going to get kicked up um, and also the depth so the light can't penetrate the deep water as easily um, and so it's going to be darker down there anyway if everyone's kicked up the silt um and all the all the dirt from the bottom then that's going to block the light getting down to deeper depths i don't know if you've ever seen a video on the youtube channel of barney go down to the hydrobox but you can go down there at midday and it is so dark like you know the light just doesn't get down there so you'll need torches and extra bits of kit then to be able to go down can i just interrupt for a um, second there um you're saying about the hydrobox uh, hydrobox it is absolutely pitch black when you are at that depth um you can look up and you'll see the surface lit up which is really strange because having light above us you tend to expect to have light around you and then you look back down it's still pitch black where you are it's, it's very weird um and when you're doing that sort of diving it, it's not really enough just to have a torch you really need to have a second backup torch as well just in case one does fail and i have actually had a torch fail on the hydro box and it's lucky i had another one because otherwise it'd be really difficult to figure out how to get back um so the next slide is about the water temperature and salinity but i thought i'd just take this note I put in here is that sports diver is when I started buying my own kit. So ocean diver, you've got your mask fins. But sports diver, when you're going deeper and it's getting a bit darker, I'm not saying you have to go out and kick yourselves up, but it's the start of like your proper dive career. Ocean diver, everyone can do. If you're going to be a sports diver, people are now looking up to you. Um, so if you can, uh, maybe talk to some of your instructors about maybe getting a bit of your own kit, especially if it's going to be cold and dark, then it's definitely something I would recommend um moving on the climate has an effect on the temperature so obviously like barney said there's always a lag behind it getting cold on the surface and then the water getting cold and the water getting warm um but you need to take that into account you know if you want to be doing deep dives i'd look to do them probably in warmer weather it's still not going to be tropical down there but it's going to be warmer than it is if you go in like february um and the temperature also changes the depth yeah so the deeper you go the colder it is there is some science behind it. The cold water is just denser and just sinks to the bottom. So obviously it's always going to be warmer at the top. Um, the currents that you might experience, not necessarily in Stony, but when you go out and about and you're diving um, away from normal conditions, the currents can carry the warm or the cold water. So you might feel a stream of warm water come past you or it could just like shock you and be really chilly. You know, it just depends. You'd have to ask someone local what the currents carry. Um, and then thermocline. So Barney mentioned earlier, if you go under nine metres at Stony Cove, you can feel a sudden drop. Like all of a sudden it just gets really chilly. 
Um, and you can actually sometimes see those in the water. So those lines in the diagram might be thermocline. So you go past one of them and it goes from like 18 degrees to like eight all of a sudden. Like it's just the way it is. Sometimes you can see them in the water, but you can definitely feel them, especially on the way up when it gets warm. Um, and finally, the salinity. So the salt in the water, I'm sure you've all heard of like the Red Sea. And it just, you, you know, you just like float on it or the Dead Sea. I can't remember which one it is. But in the sea, you're going to be more buoyant. So you're going to take more weight in with you than you would in Stony Cove. Um, yeah. If if you're doing, uh, this... sorry to interrupt again. If you're doing particularly right. extreme dives in places like the sea notes of Mexico or, or whatnot, you can get something called heliocline, which is basically a mixture of fresh water and salt water. And it looks, it almost looks like a, a heat haze, you know, when you're you're looking down a road, for example, on a hot day, and you can kind of see it shimmering. Uh, it looks kind of like that, but you can end up essentially swimming in fresh water and then swimming in salt water in the same body of water. It's very, very strange. But you need to bear in mind, if you're crossing that border, then it makes a big difference. It's pretty rare, and you probably won't ever come across it. It's just, it's an interesting little kind of quirk of some some dive sites. Uh, the surface conditions, so we've talked about surface conditions if it's like uh, stormy and you're going to struggle to get in and out of the water, but you also need to think about um, the travel to and from the dive site. So obviously we just drive to Stony Cove and if it's raining you just put your windscreen wipes on, no big deal. But if you're going on a big long journey and the dive site's so far away from the car park it's icy, then are you prepared to take that walk down to the entrance of the water with all your kit on in the ice? Maybe not. You know, you need to consider these things before you go. Check the weather a few days before. Um, the entry and exit from the water we've already talked about. Um, you know, if you're trying to get on a rib and it's like the waves are 10 metres high, you've got a fat chance of getting back on there. So you need to really think about these things before you go and plan um, how you're going to get in and out. Uh, the next three altogether, the mist and the fog, the wave height, which I just mentioned, and the glare. Um they can make the surface cover difficult to find you. So if I'm on a boat and there's big waves, I'm going to struggle to see you. That's generally why we've got big DSMBs that are you know, two metres long and bright orange so that better to see you. But people still might see if there's a lot of, might struggle to see, sorry, if there's a lot of glare or it's foggy. So you just need to think about that. You know, you're going to take extra lights to wave around. You're going to have a GPS, you know, just certain things you need to think about now as a sports diver um that might affect you and also other water users i mean i don't think we go in any large shipping boats obviously if there's big like shipping containers nearby um they might not see you they're a bit bigger than you uh, other dive vessels if you're going to if you're going on holiday and there's a really popular dive site there might be four or five dive boats around so actually getting your dive boat to see that it's your group and not another group that's just come up can be quite difficult and then yachts and jet skis and motorboats. Jet skis was around and they put people on them that definitely should not be able to hire them. So they might be dangerous to you and motorboats. And, and people just swan around in their yachts and have no concern for what else is going on in the water. So, you know, they're all things that can be dangerous for us as divers. Uh, I go on to talk about local site knowledge. If you are diving away from your, from your regular, so like we all know Stony Cove and we've all got a map of it. Um, probably. I mean, you've seen a map of it at least. Uh, who would you ask if you needed more knowledge? Uh, the first one here is a dive manager or a local instructor will give you a brief before you go in. They'll describe the site to you, um, especially if they're local. They'll know the anticipated conditions. So they'll know that in March it's generally whatever temperature or the physics is going to be X, Y, Z. Uh, and the maximum dive time due to tides. So if you know, if they know the tides and they know on average how long you can be down for, you can plan that into your dive and so when you've gone past 35 minutes you're like right the tides are going to change in 10 minutes we need to start thinking about moving or leaving um stuff like that a dive center or a local branch you know when we go to the farn islands we hire a dive boat and then the local center there knows exactly what's going on the local guides will know you know they do that dive daily they do it every year they'll know exactly what's going on um, and they'll have a list of all the dive sites and all the attractions underwater and which buoy is on top of what attraction. Um, and finally, dive books, guides and magazines. I guess that's a bit dated, but, you know, the internet. 
uh, some books might be out of date, but you know, a local a local guide might recommend one to you that's good still, and they might have an idea. But the internet, you can find anything on Google nowadays. I'm sure if you googled like Fan Islands dive site, you'd find a picture like the one on the right, or even a proper a proper map. But something like the picture on the right, the little guide of where you're going to be diving, can be so helpful. If you know that you've got to go all the way past the boat and then go left, then you know that once you're underwater, you see that wreck. And you're right, I've got to just go past it and left. You know, you've got an idea before you jump in and someone's trying to tell you and you don't understand. Uh, just with regards uh, to... Really exciting... Sorry, sorry. Just with yeah. regards to the internet thing. Um, there's uh, it's something that uh, a lot of people don't know about, but there's a website called Finstrokes, as in finning your, your strokes, uh, finstrokes.com. And it's basically got a database of pretty much the majority of dive sites around the UK, both inland and in the sea. So if you're ever struggling for some inspiration, that's a really good place to go on the internet. Um, dive books and guides and magazines, they're, they're all very well and good. And yes, uh, wrecks don't move that much, weirdly. Um, <laughs> the, the thing you have to be careful, really, of is people can be a little bit funny with giving up their prized wreck location. They, they don't want people to be, you know, swarming the wreck and ruining it for them. So what they sometimes might do is give a slightly incorrect coordinate system. Um, so you'll end up looking for the wreck 500 metres off where it actually is. And they know that. But ultimately, it's kind of up to you to really pinpoint that wreck. If if you're properly equipped, you'll have an echo sounder and, and decent sounding equipment, which will be able to spot the wreck on the bottom of the seafloor. Um, so dive books, guides, magazines, stuff like that, you've got to be a little bit careful of in terms of how accurate the information really is. Yeah, from that list, I would just recommend going to a local dive branch or messaging a local dive club, especially if you're diving with us and we go on holiday we'll just use the dive center and they just take you to the wreck it's just a lot easier but obviously if you're planning your own dive then like barney said probably look into it before you get in and realize there's absolutely nothing there um this next bit very exciting risk assessment I knew it was coming um so first we're going to talk about the conditions you might list in your risk assessment so the first off is the temperature whether it's going to be too hot for a dry suit or a semi-dry you might want to be in a short wet suit if it's too cold like, do you want to take a trainee in a semi-drive, like an hour in February in Stony? Mm, maybe not, but it might have to be done. If they're cold, um, they might have reduced reactions. They might really not want to be there and be unenthusiastic. And if you've got a big dry suit on with a big undersuit on, you might have reduced mobility and not be able to press your buttons properly. So that's all just things to think about in your risk assessment. Uh, secondly, you've got your visibility. If the visibility is going to be two metres or you're not going to see your hand from your face, there is a chance you're going to get separated from your buddy or your instructor. It's probably not your fault. You know, two metres away isn't really that far, you know, but we do kind of, you know, we shepherd you all to stick together. It's because if the visibility is bad, we're not going to be able to see you down. Like, you know, if you're an arm that's away from me and I can't see you, then that's going to be a problem. We do have measures to overcome that. We've got buddy lines and that we can attach each other. You know, we can hold on to each other. Um, but that is something you would plan for. And finally, the current. Um, if you're swimming against a current and you're finning really hard and you get cramped or you get exhausted and then you start breathing loads of air, then you're going to have to have like a secondary plan for that. If someone's really struggling, you might just have to abort the dive, but that's something you would account for in your risk assessment. Um, the depth. So obviously now we're diving deeper. We're going, you know, past 30 metres. There might be an increased risk of DCI, decompression illness, um, and that is definitely something you'll have to account for, um, what measures you'll take, and obviously we cover that in a, in a later lecture. Uh, nitrogen narcosis, we also come across that. It's basically like being drunk underwater, which sounds more fun than it probably is. Um, but we do do a dry dive, which we had planned for this year, it's got cancelled, but I'd recommend going on that because they put you in a dry chamber you literally go in in like your day clothes and they they put you down to like 50 meters so you can experience it so that you know what's going on if it ever happens to you in the water but i would definitely recommend signing up to that when it comes around again because that looks really good um and then any incident further from the surface so you're if you're down 30 meters and something happened i don't know you might cut your knee on a rock i'm not really sure what you could do down at 30 meters but if you do that you need to have a risk assessment done that kind of stuff if you're on a wreck and you rip your dry suit then you need to have a plan in case that happens um silly things people do silly things all the time but it's obviously a lot more risky when you're down deep uh surge you've got your breathing gas supply so 
if you lose um, your second stage, uh, I don't know, it goes into free flow, it gets knocked out of your mouth and like, I don't know how it would come off. I don't know. If you lose that, though, you need to account for that. Obviously, we teach you that you give someone your alternate source. So your buddy would then give you a second stage to breathe from, and then you'd have to abort the dive. But that goes in your risk assessment. Um, like I said earlier, the currents, if you're putting in higher effort, then you're going to deplete your air supply quicker. If you're colder, you're going to breathe quicker. Or if you're scared of the dark or something, I don't know that it could happen like you could literally not know what's going to come out of the corner of a wreck and stop breathing fast um and also if you're too cold um and you start breathing faster but then you're taking shallow breaths so then your buoyancy might be a bit funny so then you're putting more air in your bcd and then you deplete your air supply you just need to account for all of these sorts of things and then finally your equipment if you go in and then your equipment breaks or it's faulty um then you need to account for that but also if you get new equipment, so I said earlier that I bought a load of new equipment at Sports Diver, I went in the water and I was like, so crap, it was dreadful. Um, but you might struggle with your buoyancy, your straps might not, might not be done upright, you, you're off on one side, you just you might really struggle with new equipment, so you should tell your instructor definitely before you go in that you've bought a load of new kit, um, so if everything goes peak tall, they already know about it. Uh, moving on to your personal limits. So st- it sounds silly. Don't be peer pressured and don't rush in. You know, you're qualified to 20 metres right now and your depth progression will take you to 35. But definitely you don't have to go that far. If going down to the hydro box at 35 metres in the pitch black does not sound like it's for you, then it doesn't have to be. There is plenty to see in the ocean, in closed water at 20 metres. There's plenty for you to see. So you don't have to feel like you go to 35. It is definitely not pressured just stay within your limits um if you don't want to do it you don't have to do it it is challenging you know you do push yourself but it's not the sort of thing where you can get to 35 meters and go actually that's not for me and then bomb it up to the surface um that's not an option you just have to know that it's going to you know you play it's going to be dark it's going to be cold but if you've got the right measures in place you'll definitely feel a lot more comfortable being at that depth especially if you know it's coming. And I think that that brings us on to quiz number two, which is also should have a QR code. That's um, absolutely right. Yep. Thanks for that, Amy. Um, yeah, so same again, guys. There's either a link in the description or there's a QR code on the screen. Um, feel free just to, to get onto that quiz, give us some answers. And we'll give it a couple of minutes just to see what you guys can come up with, see if you're paying attention. Um, so two, there's two questions again. Uh, one of them is, where might you look for information about a dive site? And then another one is, list some things we should think about when heading to a dive site. So slightly more open-ended questions this time, but just have a go, see what you can come up with, and we'll have a look at the results in a minute. Okay, cool. It looks like we're getting there. Um, just if you're watching this in future, not live, uh, by all means, it, it's likely these quizzes won't work for you. But by all means, have a pause the video, have a think, see what you can come up with. Uh, if you've got any questions or anything that maybe you feel haven't been answered, feel free just to contact one of our instructors. They'll be more than happy to help you out. Um, and and yeah. 
Right, we'll uh, start looking at some of the answers then. So what have we got? We've got um, some online, yeah, internet. So like we said, there's plenty of resources out there. Someone's remembered the Finstrokes website. That's a good one. If you want to go and have a look at that after the lecture, by all means, go and have a look. Uh, what else? We've got dive books, magazines, that kind of thing. Yep, absolutely. They're good for stationary points like wrecks, but again, just make sure you keep on top of how accurate they are. Uh, mean people with the wrong coordinates yeah again be careful of you know Jim down the pub who says he swears that wreck was there and actually it's 500 meters the other way so be careful of that there's one dive center um, which is good local knowledge as well uh, so for example if we're going on a trip we'd want to go and contact the harbour master maybe uh, the skipper of the boat we're hiring something like that those guys have been there for years they know where all the wrecks are they know off the top of their head um, so absolutely a good resource to to get and and see how that's going um, right let's go to the next question then so list some things we should think about when heading to a dive site so this is quite a mix of things we're expecting to come up here so conditions yep so looking about uh, weather is on there as well uh, different kind of uh, surface conditions so although the surface weather might be brilliant you could have a major current underneath um, you've got to plan for that sort of stuff tides is another one that's that's a good conditions um, conditions one that's that's really something we can plan for because it's so predictable but it's absolutely something we need to consider uh, if we think about the qualification level of our trainees or, or our dive members visibility is another good one that can have a lot of things affect it uh, I'm sure you can remember all those that Amy said um, well, facilities, yeah, that's a good one we haven't mentioned. So, going up to the Outer Hebrides for an extreme expedition, where are you going to get your fills? Where are you going to go to loo? Where are you getting food and, and fuel for any compressors you take up? All that sort of stuff. It's, it's really something you've got to keep in mind. Um, on the flip side of that, going to Stony Cove, you could pretty much buy whatever you want there. There's, there's loads of facilities. There's showers, toilets, restaurant. There's a bloody dive shop. It's It's got all sorts of stuff you need. So it's a real difference between the two and it's something you have to consider. Okay, cool. I think we've uh, answered all those questions there. So let's head back to the PowerPoint for a little summary. So what have we covered today? Um, we've cover basically why would you want to become a sports diver and what's the point so we've looked at the sports diver course um, what's involved in that and what you have to do for it so remember that you've got to have a little bit of self-study maybe more so than the ocean diver course we've also looked at what sports divers can actually do uh, obviously the the different depth progression available and maybe some equipment that you might be able to use uh, we'll cover that in another lecture that's quite a good lecture actually uh, we've had a look at the variety in diving you'll experience as a sports diver and and what that can offer and how maybe you can plan for that and also how temperature and surface conditions can affect each other um, and other underwater conditions as well and then finally just a quick look at risk assessments in general Okay, cool. So that's pretty much it for today. Um, thank you for coming along. It's, it's again, the first time we've done this, so a little bit experimental. Um, hopefully you enjoyed it and it was helpful. Um, if you feel like you want to recap at all, you can by all means drag back in the video now um, or it will be available on the YouTube channel in a couple of hours, hopefully, uh, for you to rewatch whenever you want. Um, obviously, if you've watched this video all the way through, you'll be at this point and you'll be thinking I want to be able to get this signed off in my qualification books so if you want to do that by all means go ahead um, use my instructor number which is 8896 and just to make sure that we're uh, we're being fair and no one's just cheating and putting down the number um, just write down the side margin the code word which uh, let's say it's pineapple shall we say so write pineapple next to your to your lesson and I'll know you've watched it properly and you haven't just skipped to the end um, so thank you again for coming along um, if you've got any more questions feel free to put them in the chat we'll hang around for a minute or two and answer any of those um, if you haven't thank you for coming again and have a good night
So we haven't got any questions at the moment, so I'm assuming there are none, which is probably a good sign. We've, we've done it right. Um, if you're still here, go home, do something useful with your life. Uh, if you're watching this in future and you, and you have a question, obviously you can't ask us live. Um, feel free to contact the club, anyone who's working at the club. I'm sure they'll be happy to, to answer any questions you have. Uh, and again, thank you for watching and I'll see you in a bit.